Before we begin, I'd like to give a huge shout out to Altex TV. I'd also like to thank him because in his most recent video, he gave me multiple shout outs throughout the video and even linked my channel in the description. Well, his description anyway. That's obvious though. Basically, the video is titled Subscriber Comments, and in it he talks about the subscribers that have commented to him multiple times, and yes, I'm someone who comments to him a bunch of times. And while I've been shout out in other videos before, I've never been shout out quite like this. I've only been shout out briefly in like maybe a poll review where I commented something about a YouTuber poll. Other than that though, I've never really been shouted out in this way before and I really appreciated it. So once again, thank you Altex TV. Now to on to the video. So we got a new Clone Wars episode yesterday and you know what that means. I'm not going to talk about it at all. Instead, I'm going to talk about Gotham. This is crazy. Yes, I know what you're thinking right now. JQ, Gotham ended one year ago today. Yeah, that definitely has, that's definitely not the reason I'm making this video. In all seriousness, I know you're tired of cringing, so I'll just tell you this right now. I love Gotham. And yes, I know this show is basically old news. Nobody is even talking about it anymore because it ended last year. Literally last year today, April 25th. I don't know if you guys are watching this today, but yes, it ended one year ago today. But that's why I'm not trying to make this video for view purposes that was the purpose of making these two videos that are now unlisted this is simply a passion project for the show that i love even if i didn't love the conclusion but hey this isn't going to be a video about that this is going to be a positive video about gotham because well i love gotham despite the conclusion being a little underwhelming i still love gotham the overall show in my opinion it is a great show that's super underrated full of great characters great storytelling and yes a bit of sam raimi camp the best way to describe this show is a mix between sam raimi's spider-man trilogy and christopher nolan's dark knight trilogy that is strange trust me it's way better than you think it is way better than it sounds because i know it sounds ridiculous doesn't it but believe it or not, Batman's always had a bit of goof to him. Granted, he's not a super goofy superhero like, say, The Flash or Spider-Man. He doesn't really make jokes. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have a bit of goof to him. I mean, Joker is just a villain that's bleached white because he fell in chemicals. Yeah, that's, the, that's Joker. So some of his villains are goof and some things center around him are goof. Which isn't a bad thing, by the way. I mean, Batman's a character from a comic book. Comic books are basically built on goof. And because they tell great stories with these characters you're going to care about. But my point is, comic books are goofy sometimes. So it's only natural that comic book film adaptations should have a bit of goof to them, right? And a lot of people tend to see past the Batman's goof. But I mean, yeah, it's kind of hard to comprehend it, but it's true. Batman does have a bit of goof to his stories. And this show incorporates that very well while staying true to the Batman mythology and whatnot. And let me tell you, the goof mixed with the seriousness, it's perfect. Brilliant the way they do it. Absolutely brilliant. And I just can't stress that enough. These characters are written very, very well. And yeah, some things are goofy. But I mean, like I said, comic books are goofy. It's just something you got to get used to. Okay. I praise the show a little bit, what, but what about the characters? Are the characters good? Well, considering I hate The Mandalorian because of its lack of character, you can all assume that yes, the characters are good. Well, nope, they're not. They're amazing, brilliant. I just can't stress enough how amazing the characters are. It should be a crime because these characters are so good. So why don't we focus on them individually, huh? I also start to start off with Selena Kyle. Let me just say, Cameron Beacon Dove, in my opinion, is the best Selena Kyle in live action. And that's not to say that Michelle Pfeiffer and Anne Hathaway were bad. Both were pretty good, and I really liked Anne Hathaway and uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. But here's the thing, I don't feel like those, cat those characters captured Catwoman in the best way, or at least the most comic book accurate way. What I mean to say is, Michelle Pfeiffer was aesthetically like Catwoman, you can tell Selena Kyle's design of the show is inspired off that, but aesthetically, she seemed like Catwoman, but the actual character personality just doesn't feel like Catwoman to me every time I watch it. Now, I still love Batman Returns, but she just doesn't feel like Catwoman to me. It's a small nitpick, but uh, I know it's controversial, too. And Anne Hathaway was fine. I actually really liked her a lot more than most people. I used to really hate her, but now I've liked her a lot more, and she's a lot more like comic book Catwoman. 
But the thing is, she doesn't really seem to have a lot of chemistry with Bruce, with uh, Christian Bale. And I'm not sure if it's no chemistry or if it's just they don't get a lot of scenes together. Because some scenes are really good. But, uh, I don't know. I wanted, I just wanted a bit more. I don't know. She's not really in a lot of The Dark Knight Rises. At least with Bruce. So, I mean, I don't know. It's a small nitpick. She kind of just doesn't really fit in with the rest of the film as well. I'm always just kind of taken out of the film every time she pops on screen because she just doesn't seem like she belongs in the film. At least not in the way they're trying to make her relevant. But whatever, still, both are fine with what they're given. Also, Hathaway's suit was awful. Beacon Dove was basically a perfect mix between the two. Anne Hathaway's personality, kind of like the comics, and Michelle Pfeiffer's uh, look, I guess. I mean, we never really get to see her in a Catwoman suit, but the Catwoman suits that she gets eventually are very Catwoman-ish, even if we never get the cat ears. Along with that, Selena Kyle gets a lot of great stories in this show. The one with uh, her mother coming back, and we get to focus on her family a little bit, but not too much. And she always has a lot of in interesting storylines. Now, some of them, actually most of them, are entwined with Bruce. There's only, I can't really think of many that aren't intertwined with Bruce. But whatever, they're still really great for what they are. They very much feel like Catwoman stories. Like, they get the character right. It's what I'm saying. She develops really well, and it's really interesting to see it the whole time. I mean, season one alone captures the character of Catwoman better than all live-action films thus far. The show also does a great job at establishing how different Catwoman and Bruce really are and how similar they, they really are. They both go about killing differently. Catwoman doesn't shy away from killing as much as Bruce does, but she's still willing to do it. This is an aspect I was missing from all the films that Catwoman starred in, which I guess is only two so so far. But um, I was they kind of dove dived into it in The Dark Knight Rises, but not as much as they could have. But I don't exactly blame that film because, well, it was like two hours and 45 minutes, so... Yeah, and people were complaining that was super long, too, so, I mean, maybe maybe we didn't exactly need that. I'd have still been fine with it, though. And that's not to put down Lily Simmons, also. If you didn't know, Lily Simmons played Catwoman in the finale, and she also did a terrific job, and I think is the second-best live-action Catwoman. She also did a great job, and she felt like that version of Catwoman grown up. Again, both did a terrific job, but I'll mainly be referring to Beacon Dova throughout this video because, well, she played her most of the time. I mean, L Lily Simmons only voiced her or played her in one episode, so I'm not really going to talk about her too much, but she did a great job nonetheless. However, moving on to other great characters, the Penguin is probably my favorite villain on the show. He, It's really hard to decide between him and Jerome, but I seriously think he might be my favorite, probably just because he's a season regular. Let me just say, the Penguin here is amazing. I mean, the villains in general are genuinely great, I guess, but Penguin is, like, special. He is so insanely good. Like I said, it should be a crime that he's as good as he actually is. I mean, who would have thought that the Penguin, of all people, would be debatably the best villain in Gotham? Even when there's tons of villains that I myself have wanted to see on the big screen forever, and yeah, I'm saying Penguin's the best. You got Professor Pig, three iterations of the Joker, and... I'm debating that Penguin is the best villain. And I mean, it's not like Penguin's my favorite villain in the Batman mythos or anything. I mean, my favorite villain's the Joker, but I'm still debating whether Penguin's the best villain or not because the character is amazing in the show. He is arguably the best part of the show because the character is so great. I legitimately 100% believe it's impossible not to feel even a tad bit of sympathy for this guy. We watch Penguin get destroyed multiple times. People hurt him in his life. He had a terrible life in Gotham. People abused him, and the only person who didn't abuse him or who saw him as something more than just a weasel to be abused was his mother. I mean, a lot of times you root for this guy, and yet he's the villain. I love stories that make you root for the villain, even though you know what they're going to do is awful. Another fun aspect of Penguin's character is whenever he's paired up with the Riddler, which happens a lot. Penguin and the Riddler is the best duo you've never imagined. These two just bring so much to the show with not only their friendship chemistry, but also just how fun and likable these two are. And speaking of the Riddler... He is probably my third favorite villain on the entire show. I honestly love this guy. He's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Corey Michael Smith is fantastic as the Riddler. Again, absolutely amazing. 
After what Jim Carrey did to the character, it's refreshing to see a Riddler so sympathetic. He's honestly probably the most sympathetic character on the show because his turn is heartbreaking. You don't want him to become the Riddler, but you know that's going to happen, and it's heartbreaking. There are tons of moments when you debate he becomes the Riddler, but I truthfully don't believe he becomes the Riddler until like season three. But that's a conversation for another time. Nigma is basically the prototype Arthur Fleck, or I guess the original Arthur Fleck. What Walking Phoenix did for the Joker is what Corey Michael Smith did for the Riddler, except, well, Walking Phoenix isn't my favorite Riddler, but that, again, another story for another time. And of course, Jim Gordon is a great character in the entire show. He is definitely one of the biggest highlights. If you didn't know, fun fact, Ben McKenzie actually played Batman in Batman Year Run. I actually, I actually thought it was pretty good in Year One, but uh, I apparently a lot of people weren't big fans of him, which is totally fine, but I respectfully disagree. Now, some characters are just kind of hit and miss. Barbara Keen and Tabitha are kind of hit and miss. I actually really like Tabitha, but Barbara Keen mainly is very hit or miss. Sometimes she's good, sometimes time she's bad and no not like oh i'm good now now i'm bad way but more so in a my character's dumb here but she's pretty good here way for example she's pretty bad in season one but pretty good in season two pretty okay in season three and it's kind of bleh in season four and is amazing in season five season five is where i believe she is 100 percent at her best okay now let's get into what you all been waiting for and that's bruce wayne the Batman. Now, when it comes to Batman, he's about as close to my heart as you can possibly get. He's my favorite superhero of all time, and that will never change. And when it comes to most of the film's betrayals, I have issues. The only one I really think I love is Christian Bale. Michael Keaton had a unique Batman in Batman Returns. It was kind of bland in Batman 89. There's only a few Batman actors I love in live action. Actually, there's only two, and that's this guy and Christian Bale. Christian Bay all the way. Still though, David Mazuz is incredible. He's the only Batman in live action to truthfully understand all the parts of Batman the best, or at least perfectly. And yeah, I'm not saying Christian Bale and Michael Keaton don't understand Batman, it's just the writing didn't really understand Batman. Actually, in the Dark Knight trilogy, the writing for Batman was very good, it's just the voice was kinda dumb, and that was basically it. I loved his Batman nonetheless. Still, if there's one thing all the live-action Batman actors tend to lack, it's the detective side to Batman. Well, guess what? This one has all of it. Now, I guess you could say Adam West had that, and he did. I agree. He did have that. But personally, he didn't really capture what I depict as Batman, even for the time, and that's another discussion for another time. Adam West was still great, don't get me wrong, but I mean, he didn't really capture Batman. He just kind of captured a super light, night, goofy Batman. So it's just not really by my Batman, even by that time standards. Mizzou cap Mizzou's captures the detective side of Batman, the knowing how to fight, super good at fighting, martial arts skills Batman, the mindful of his surroundings Batman, basically everything Christian Bale accomplished, and an even better voice in the end. Don't worry, Christian, you're still great. Now... Christian Bale is my favorite Batman live action. I've made that very clear. I'm extremely biased. I by no means think he's a perfect Batman, but I do legitimately believe he's the best live action Batman, and he is my personal favorite. I'm not going to lie. Is he my personal favorite Batman of all time? No, that goes to Kevin Conroy. But in terms of a Batman who captures everything I want a Batman actor to encapsulate, it's the Veed Mizzou's. Now, like I said, Adam West captures a lot of great aspects, but I mean... He's, again, a super goofy, light night Batman. It's not really what I depict Batman to be, even in the Silver Age of time. But still, I understand a lot of people love him way more than I do. I'm not saying he's bad, it's just, you know what, I'm not even going to explain it. David Masseuse is still great. He captures a dark, brooding Batman as a child, baby, but he's still dark and brooding. And he's smart. He's a detective. Oh, man. How long has it been since we've been seen a Detective Batman? Was it Mask of the Phantasm? If you asked me to rank all the live-action Batmans, he would come in at number two. Easily. Now I want to talk about a specific storyline in Season 4. Now, I'm going to get a little bit of spoilers here, but whatever. I mean, some of you don't even watch the show, so why would you care? Did I just, did I just really say, show why would you care? In all seriousness, Season 4 is my favorite season of Gotham. And... 
<sighs> I'm going to talk about one arc that the films get wrong so many times, and that's Batman Killing. This series discusses Batman's killing rule in the best way, period, at least in the visual media. Better than all the films, better than Batfleck, better than Michael Keaton Batman murdering people, he captures the killing core of Batman right. Throughout the majority of the series, he has no killing rule, and he does, even in season five, the final season. He always does, except for one time, and that's in season four. Basically, the start of the season, it takes place a few months after Bruce finished training with the League of Shadows and Ra's al Ghul. Now Ra's al Ghul is somewhere in Gotham and Bruce is hunting him as the vigilante that Jim Gordon's not chasing because he's not aware of him yet. In episode 4, Ra's al Ghul reveals himself to Bruce and chases after a knight that's in the possession of a, of a young kid named Alex, whom Bruce befriends in the episode. At the end of the episode, Ra's has Alex with his knife on his throat and is telling Bruce to give him the knife. Bruce refuses, though, because he knows giving him the knife will, will basically have everything destroyed. If you didn't know, I won't spoil too much, but the knife is basically the key. It's a MacGuffin, as you'd probably expect. In the end, Ray goes through, is through with it and kills Alex. Yes, this show features child murdering now. Are you strong enough? So in the next episode, Bruce is conflicted and is basically going to join the dark side just so he can kill Raish because, well, Raish killed Alex. And at the end, Bruce surprisingly goes through with it. Before your very eyes and there will be nothing you can do about it. Die. Now you're probably thinking right now, Jake, how can such a big Batman fanboy that hates it when Batfleck and Michael Keaton kill be okay with it when Gotham does it? He just killed. How, how can you be okay with that? Well, you see, here's the thing. Yes, he did indeed kill, but there is one huge difference besides their age. His, him killing Raish was served a storytelling purpose. And a brilliant one at that. You see, my issue with Batfleck killing isn't that he kills. It's, first of all, that he kills in his first film, without any context, and he, it's not used as a storytelling purpose. Superman isn't mad at Batman because he's killing people. Alfred isn't even mad that he's killing people. It's not really ever properly utilized in that film, therefore creating a really stupid thing. There's no reason for him to kill in that film. And I'm just going to skip 89 because, well, I he basically has no character in that film, so I'm just going to jump right to Batman Returns. Now, I love Batman Returns. I've already established that uh, vaguely early on the video when I was talking about Selena Kyle. The reason I love Batman Returns goes outside of how great of a film I think it actually is, but Bruce Wayne... It's the first time in a film Bruce Wayne killing people is actually utilized to some extent for a character arc. And let me tell you, it was almost perfect. You see, in Batman Returns, Batman starts out killing people way more. It's way more emphasized in the film. It's why he throws a dude down the shaft and blows him up. But by the end of the film, Batman tells Selina not to kill Max and that they'll bring him to the police. He has a change of heart. My issues lie with the middle of that. I think... I'm pretty sure that he just learned this through watching Selena, since Selena was kind of a parallel to him. She was trying to kill just like he was, and she saw it was bad, I think. But it's not really very clear why he came to this decision. I'm really just guessing, and I'm hoping. And I think that's a brilliant idea. They just didn't fully utilize it. I still love the arc. It's just not entirely clear why he came to that decision. It just kind of comes out of nowhere, and I wish there was more of it explored. Nonetheless, though, that's my little rant on that. In this show, it actually has a storytelling purpose. This event is essentially the Kickstarter for Bruce's arc this season, and it's brilliant. Let me tell you, this is one of the most brilliant Batman arcs I've ever seen. Strangely enough, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I want to spoil it too much, even though I've already spoiled plenty. Still, it's a really great arc, and I think really more people need to discuss it. Instantaneously after he kills Raish, he feels remorse. In the very next scene, he's talking to Alfred about how it's a deed he'll never be able to take back, and it's a very dramatic and sad scene. It's very sad that this is how he turned out. He ended up killing Raish, and that's something he vowed never to do. 
and he did it. It's a very sad thing to watch. And over the next few episodes, Bruce has a massive mental breakdown and, like, becomes a completely different person and also overly depressed and goes through a lot of pain. You see here, it's very clearly a part, of, a part of his arc, and it gets a lot more attention than it does in the films. I mean, Batfleck basically has no attention to it, and Michael Keaton has some, but not nearly enough. Here, it's full focus and very much clearly a part of his arc, which pretty much every Gotham fan loves, I'm pretty sure. I've never met a Gotham fan that hates this arc, because, well, it's a great arc. I mean, if you personally dislike it, that's totally fine, but personally, I just don't understand. It's it's probably my favorite arc from him in the entire show, to be honest. Now, before I start, stop talking about how great Bruce is, I want to quickly discuss this one scene that's always stuck with me and might even be my favorite Bruce Wayne scene. Call me a coward again. You're a coward. An ignorant, brutish... Costs wind. Now, if you're gonna be a big man, all you have to do is outlast him. Stop! I really think he wants a beating. An ignorant, brutish, cowardly clown. Yep. He likes it, all right. And this right here is really only icing on the cake. Do I even really need to discuss why this scene is brilliant? Do I really need to discuss it? I Do I? Like, you guys get it, right? Like, you don't even need to explain it, right? This is one of those shows that gets very invalid criticism, and one of them I was going to address right now. A lot of people say, you know, what's the point of making a Batman show if you're not going to craft it around Batman? But that's exactly what they do. It's just Batman as a kid, which, yeah, I know would throw some, some people off, but, I mean, it's still great. You see, season one isn't really Bruce's season, I'll admit that. He only really starts to take center stage at, like, the end of it. But, like, season two and on, it's kind of his show. His and Jim Gordon's show. I mean, he's in a lot of season two. He's a very primary thing in it, and he gets individual episodes devoted to him, such as season two, episode 14, arguably the best episode of the series. Alright, it's that time to talk about everybody's favorite Batman villain, the Joker. When I say three hairs past a freckle, gentlemen, I do not mean five hairs past. Let's do better next time. Hmm? This show is by far known the best for its Joker aspects. For a lot of people, the only tuned in for the Joker episodes, and to those people I ask, what is wrong with you? Okay, in all seriousness... A lot of people just tuned in for some Joker episodes, unfortunately, and the Joker story was bizarre to say the least, but I still found it enjoyable. So I'm not going to give too many spoilers if you're scared about that. Um, I, I don't know if you are, but... Now, I don't want to talk too much about the Gotham Joker story, even if it is intriguing. Uh, I just don't like talking about it as much, and... Honestly, I think it's way overly talked about. It's, again, I want to praise the other things in the show. But, of course, I know every Gotham video basically requires something about the Joker. So, I'll just give a quick intake on my, on my uh, opinion on the Joker in this show. Jeremiah was a good take. I like that he was different than Jerome. But it's odd because he feels like a massive step back. If Jeremiah had come for first and... Man, I'm really messing up my words today. If Jeremiah had come first and Jerome second, it would have been different because it would have felt like an actual upgrade. Jerome would have felt like an upgrade from Jeremiah. But instead we get Jerome and then Jeremiah, which feels... It's a very bizarre choice they made. And I get why, because Jerome was too much like Joker... And they couldn't legally use Joker. I don't know. It just... It, the overall ending ending product was just kind of bleh. I don't know. It's... Like I said, it's very bizarre the way they went about it. Alright, there's a lot to say. You can come back. Now, the characters aren't the only good thing in this show. There's other things. It understands Batman, the characters, and the others... You know, like Catwoman, uh, Joker, whatnot. They understand it very well, and they execute it very well. They portray these characters very accurately and put their own spins on them. Kind of like what Heath Ledger did with Joker. Yeah, it's the same character, but he put his own spin on it. 
Gotham the city feels like a terrible city to live in because it is in the context of the show. <sighs> it really it's, it's such a good show. I don't, I don't know how to say it better than that. It's just a good show. You need to go watch it, please. Okay, back to things. Aesthetically, it looks really good. Cinematography and individual episodes look really good, you know. It's a, it's a standard TV show cinematography and whatnot. Um, the way scenes are shot are pretty good. The characters, their stakes, uh, it presents a lot of stakes, and you care about characters, like all of them, except for maybe like a couple like Barbara Keene, depending on how you feel about her. She's a very controversial character in the Gotham fanboy community, and I guess fangirls as well. Also, the show is timeless. You see, unlike Arrow, it actually doesn't have dated humor or anything. I mean, yeah, I love Arrow season 1 and 2, but I mean, the humor in all seasons is dated. It's stuff you won't remember in like two years. Here, though, there's nothing that's dated. No type of cell phone that's dated. No type of humor that's dated. No type of dialogue that's dated. It's all, you know, typical original dialogue. And while it's not like Shakespearean or anything, it's still dialogue that doesn't date the show, and there's no cringy jokes like in Arrow that date the show. It's also aesthetically timeless. There are no cars that you'd see today. There's some cars that are a bit roundish, like in the old days. There's um, stylish look to the building, buildings, you know, but there's nothing that would make it dated or anything like that. No specific cars you'd see today, no specific TVs you'd see today. Every single TV shot in this show is a black and white screen. <sighs> okay, I've made it pretty clear that I basically love this show. I love just about everything about it. Yeah, not every storyline works, but seriously, you people need to go watch it. This video is basically just my love letter to the series because of how much I love it. Yeah, not every storyline works, not even every character works, but it's still a great show. Please go watch it. If you legitimately call yourself a Batman fan, a heck, a Batman fanboy, someone who loves Batman so much that he criticizes him every second he's on screen, then please, just go check this show out. Yeah, season one is kind of rocky, but please, just go check it out. I beg you, it's honestly good, and it's way better than the CW Arrowverse shows, I promise. Maybe not season one, season one's okay, but I mean, the rest of the seasons, they're amazing, okay? They really are. I'm telling you guys, please, please, just believe me. This show is what I wanted The Mandalorian to be. Yeah, I didn't want some super overly campy Sam Raimi-like show, but this is essentially the opposite of The Mandalorian. Mandalorian had just, just about zero character. I don't know a thing about The Mandalorian after season one's over. I'm still trying to figure out what his character motivations are. But this show, it's amazing. Yeah, the action isn't perfect because it's focused on the characters. Shows like Mandalorian prioritized action over the characters, while shows like this prioritized characters over the action. And if you ask me, I would much rather show that prioritized character and makes me care than a show that just prioritizes action and doesn't make me care. So what are you waiting for? Go watch it. It's on Netflix. Please. Please go watch it. Please.